Uh, Christian Skarinj is uh, one of the eight members of parliament uh, at the European Parliament. As you are probably uh, aware, uh, the national delegation, when I say eight members, is not the total number, that's the Latvian delegation. And as you know, that's something that has been fixed uh, by the uh, treaty. Uh, so that's something that's the result of a political uh, vote amongst the pop populations, but it's something that's legislated that there are eight such uh, Latvian MEPs. He's also a member of two different political parties, one of them uh, being uh, Vienerti Bahia in Latvia, and the other being the European People's Party. And that is, again, something that is a little bit strange for lawyers, uh, but it's actually set in the treaty as a legal definition that political parties uh, at the European level are a positive thing for democracy. And that might be a very true statement, but it's still a little bit funny that it was chosen to be legislated that it was a good thing. But perhaps that had a good, um, a good effect, because moving from purely national delegations, we have seen the parliament de develop into having that broader uh, understanding of, of Europe, where the European political parties uh, uh, today have uh, their own meaning. And therefore, it's a very great pleasure to welcome Christianis uh, and to ask him to speak to us about being a member of the European Parliament, about the influence of the European Parliament in the uh, political life of the European Union, in the formation of policy and legislation, and also, very importantly, the links with the country of origin, in the case of Christianis, naturally Latvia, and finally also the issue of the possibilities for you for working for the European Union and especially, of course, for the European Parliament. So, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, I find it somewhat odd to be speaking English in Latvia. Uh, uh, I, I, I speak Latvian in the European Parliament uh, in the plenary, and now here I am in Latvia speaking English uh, to a group of students. Uh, I grew up in the U.S. I should be speaking very freely, but actually I speak English. Uh, I don't speak English on a daily basis uh, for 20 years now, uh, so you'll have to forgive me if, if I uh, stumble every now and again. You are second-year students, sophomore students, correct? Who will tell me how many parliamentarians there are in the European Parliament this very minute. Nine. Sorry, in the entire Parliament. <laughs> yeah, you have to count the other two in the back row. There are two more seats. 754. Yeah, it, 754. Imagine, uh, if all of these seats were full here, how many, how many students would fit? 50? 100. Okay, so imagine an auditorium uh, seven, eight times the size of this one. It's a lot of people. Uh, the Parliament is just one of the European institutions. What are the other two institutions? The Council. Right, the Council and the, uh, and the Commission. So what's the role of the Council? What's the role of the Commission? What's the role of the Parliament? This is a really boring lecture because I'm asking you. But. <laughs> Who can tell me wh what is the European Council? Who who attends the European Council? Do you vote for it? That's right, heads of member states. So heads of government. There are currently 27. Uh, this summer, uh, Croatia will be joining us. The 28th. Countries, so there, there will be 28 heads of state who come together uh, uh, in the European Council. Uh, the Council is one of the legislative bodies of the European Union. The Parliament is the other, and it works in an imperfect manner, as in many countries, an upper and a lower house. So you could say the upper house has 27 members, the lower house has 754, but for any legislation, it's almost all legislation today to be passed, both houses have to agree with each other. So a law has to be passed in one chamber and the same text has to be adopted by the other before it, it comes into play. What is the role of the European Commission in this process? 
Yeah. It, yeah, it, 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 it drafts the legislation and it's also sort of the policeman after the legislation is enacted. Uh, the European Parliament is a peculiar parliament, maybe in the world. We are one of the few parliaments that basically has no right of initiative. We don't initiate laws. Uh, when the council, who is the initiator, comes with a proposal, that proposal comes to the parliament, we look at it, and at the same time it comes to the council, they look at it. We work on it independently until we've both come to our own versions, and then we go into a process which is called a trilogue, which can go from anywhere from three to three months to, to two, three more years of sort of hammering and fighting on the, on the differences until you come to a, a final uh, a bit of legislation. So the idea what I'm trying to build up is that there's 754 people here. There's another, there's a council, there's a European commission with some 30,000 uh, 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 people working in the commission. It's a big outfit. How many are from Latvia? Yeah? No, no, I'm sorry. How many, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> how many parliamentarians are from Latvia? Nine. Nine, that's right. It's nine, not eight, but it will be eight again. <laughs> so there's an expression in English, a snowball's chance in hell. Uh, do you think a country like Latvia has a snowball chance in hell of actually influencing this tremendously large and complex process? That's really the, the question that, that, that I want to address today. Um, my short answer is yes. So I kind of skip to the conclusion. So you can tune out now if you want to. Um, but I'll take a couple of examples uh, from my own, uh, from my own uh, experience. Uh, how many of you play a musical instrument? Many of you. What instrument do you play? Drums. The drums. Okay, uh, does anyone play the piano? You play the piano. Wonderful. Okay. You play nicely? It, it, it sounds good, right? Yeah, you can read notes. When you first approached a piano, how old were you? Six. Six. Okay, so you sat, when you were six years old, you went, you sat down, you took out the notes, and you, you played a, a... No? What did it sound like? Not really good. But your mom probably said it was beautiful, right? So she encouraged you to continue. Um, musical instruments are like that. When you first pick it up, I've picked up my friend's saxophone. I can almost get a note out of it, uh, but I really can't. I can get air to pass through. Um, you, you really have to understand what all those little knobs are for, um, how the mouthpiece works. The piano is the same. It's like a musical typewriter. The notes are sort of laid out for you, but there, there, there's sort of relationship between them, some combinations which sound pleasing to the ear, other combinations which are atrocious to the ear. Then there are people who figure out how to write, uh, 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 write down music in a, in a notation, and you have the notes, and you have the, the bass and the treble clefts, and you, and you put it all together. And someone who's learned all of that can actually make beautiful music. But you, you, don't, you don't start out that way. Parliament's just like that. In fact, any group of people is just like that. Groups of people, whether they're in companies, whether they're in governments, ministries, uh, uh, NGOs, everywhere, uh, they are all organized in some set and certain pattern. The thing is, if you don't understand that pattern, it can seem like a cacophony. I don't, I don't remember how to pronounce that anymore in English. It just sounds like a jumble. Uh, but when you start to look in, Inside, you see that actually it has a lots of structure, just like the piano has structure. Oh, it has octaves, they repeat, it's not so tough, there's only how many notes, right? You can, you can learn them, not even ten. Uh, okay, so you have the, the, the black keys as well, um, so a few more. But uh, the parliament is like that. And how is parliament organized? Parliament there is organized pretty much like every parliament into political groups or political parties. And the political parties, uh, correctly stated, they consist of, so I'm a member of, of two parties, I actually consider myself a member of one, because Vienotib is part of the European People's Party. The European People's Party is a family of parties all over Europe. So uh, in Sweden we have the Moderata, uh, in uh, Denmark we have the Conservatives, uh, 
in Germany, we have the CDU, CSU, so Angela Merkel is part of our party. Uh, in, in France, uh, it's uh, Sarkozy's party, which is in a little bit of disarray and currently in opposition. Uh, in Italy, uh, Berlusconi's party, among others, uh, are, are within our family, uh, etc. So the People's Party in Spain. So it's a big family of parties. But the politicians who are in this all on socioeconomic issues, we all have a, a similar approach. We're, we're on the center right. Uh, so that's one part of parliament. We're almost 40%. It's, it's the largest group in the parliament. Then there are the socialists, then there are the liberals, then there are the greens, then there are the communists, then there are the Brits who are all sitting uh, mostly alone, uh, and then there are the non-affiliated uh, uh, who also sit alone but sort of in a group together. Um, and for any given legislation to move through, and it happens in any parliament, politics, what's the most important thing in politics? Who can tell me that? I've been in politics now 10 years. I finally figured out what the most important thing in politics is. Game face. Sorry? Game face. A game face. Okay, that helps. <laughs> the most important thing in politics is numbers. If you have the votes, you can get anything through. You can have the best arguments in the world, but if you don't have the majority of votes, it falls flat. No, no matter how game faced you are, or how charismatic you are, or, or how much you, you, you cry, or whatever, when you, when you make your uh, uh, speeches to enact these things. So for any given legislation to go through, you need a majority. In all parliaments around the world, you have the, the, the government and the opposition, right? And the, the government usually consists of, depending on what country, in, in coalition. So in Latvia, you know, we have a, a f three or four party coalition. Three. Yeah, it's a three party coalition. I have to think for a minute. But uh, no, Alstein's group, that's sort of like a, like a fourth uh, leg also. Um, you, you have politicians from various groups coming together, and they're now in, on the one side of the issue, and everyone else who's sort of outside the door, they're in the opposition. So they just criticize. Oh, you're doing it wrong. Oh, you're not caring about pensioners. Oh, the world is going to hell, and you're doing nothing about it. And then when they get in power, uh, then the former say, oh, the world is... I've been in both sides of the coin. It's, it's a fun game. Um, that's how it works. And the European Parliament doesn't work that way. The European Parliament has no coalition. It has no opposition. For any given bit of legislation, there is a, you could say, a chance coalition of the majority. And what that means is that the way, the, the way you work there is uh, you don't tend to do a lot of overt backstabbing. It's all covert. It happens the same. But it's in a very polite manner. Because if I disagree with you, say I'm on the center right and you're on the center left, I'm a conservative, you're a socialist. On the campaign trail, I say the socialists, they know nothing, and you'll say the same thing about me. But in Parliament, when we disagree, we'll say, that's an interesting view. However, I think, because on this issue, we won't vote together. But on the item, uh, agenda item number two, <coughs> we're going to be partners, and we both know it. So this is, this is how, how it works there. It makes life a little difficult. But Parliament is organized according to political parties. Now, within each political group, so my political group has, I believe the number now is 271 MEPs. That's a lot. The national parliament in Latvia has 100 MEP, uh, MPs, 271. It's like three Latvian parliaments all in one, one room. So again, how, how can you convince 300 people of anything? Well, when you look inside that group, they're also organized into subgroups. So there are parliamentarians who come from national delegations. There are the Germans, there are the, the Swedish, there are the Danes. Well, there's one Dane. Uh, there are the Poles, there are the Italians, the Spaniards, etc. And within each of these groups, there are those politicians that have a little more sway and more influence and those who have less. Uh, so when you, when you look at the parliament as a musical instrument, that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, it seems chaotic from the outside at first. But when you start to look inside, there's a very set structure. Now, a few years ago, two years ago, I read in the press that France wanted to sell a class uh, of worship called the Mistral to Russia. Who here knows what a Mistral class worship is? 
you're really not defense people. Um, no worries, I'm not either. Uh, and I certainly had no idea what that Mistral in capital letters meant, so I used the, the internet, as, as we all do, just to get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, these are something close to 200 meter long helicopter gunships. They are used for amphibious assault. They can carry some 42 tanks, 16 transport helicopters, 1,000 soldiers, and have a 69-man hospital as well. So this is, this is a forward base for aggressive warfare. Uh, I read uh, on top of it that one of, uh, one of Putin's uh, generals uh, had said that if Russia had only had such a warship during the 2008 war with Georgia, then they would have been in Tbilisi faster than Sarkozy flew to Moscow to try to stop the, the war. And then I read another thing, that another general, because Russia has lots of them, said that, and we need these warships to put in the heavily dangerous area of Kaliningrad for defense. Well, I assume you know enough geography that Kaliningrad is directly to our south on the Baltic Sea. There's really not lots of hostility in this part of the world coming from Europe. But if someone places aggressive uh, attack warships in our little body of water, uh, that really made me a little nervous. So as a patriotic national and someone who just has a sense of, of, of uh, why sell high technology uh, to someone who is outside of our military alliance, I said, I want to stop this. Just want to stop it. It's a good ambition to have. Well, I looked at the procedures of the parliament, and it turns out even if parliament unanimously voted, all 754 MEPs stood up and voted no sale, actually parliament could not stop this because it's the competence of the member states. It's actually a question of council, not of parliament. One of the quirks of, of our European architecture. But I discovered the European parliament can hold a debate on this matter and put a political framework uh, to stop such a sale in the future, or at least slow this one down, maybe now, but stop something like this in the future from happening. So I set it as my goal that I want to get this on the agenda of the parliament. Now, any of you might think, well, where's the big deal? I probably have an email account. You send it to whoever makes the decisions. You know, whenever you have the time, I'd like to have this. Please be on the agenda. Thank you very much, Grishan Skadic. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Everyone wants everything on the agenda, and it is worse than fighting uh, your way onto a five o'clock uh, uh, tram uh, here in the, in the old, you know, in the old town uh, on Bus de Bulas. It, there, it's very difficult to get anything on the agenda because most of the agenda is full of the legislation which is coming from the council that has the top priority, and any, anything else, and even that gets jostled and delayed and delayed. Anything else coming in, you need full support of, of the majority of the political groups behind you to get it on the agenda. So I would have to convince not only my group, but at least the socialists, or if not the socialists, then the, the, the Brits and, the, and the, uh, the liberals, so we could get a majority to get this on the agenda. How to do it? Um, how many of you are handy in the kitchen? OK, two of you are handy in the kitchen. I'm not. Um, but uh, I sometimes, I, I often try to help out to the dismay of everyone else in my family. Um, peeling uh, onions. Onion peeling is a fun process, right? It, because it, it demands that you have a high level of attentiveness. Because what happens if you're you know, thinking about school or you know, your next exam and you're peeling? What, what happens? Yeah, the, well, you start to cry. That's, yeah, that's a good one. Um, but a toothpick between the teeth, uh, that helps. Or running cold water. Um, but you're peeling away. And if you're not careful, you end up with nothing, because the whole onion is just a bunch of peels. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd thing that we all love to eat. Um, so I looked at the world sort of from the center of the onion. And I wanted to grow support around me, myself, sort of as layers of an onion, until I have the whole thing, starting from the center, working towards the outside. So where do I start to get support for my grand idea of getting the entire parliament to agree to my idea to put this on the table. Where do I start? Your group. Right, my group is 270, then, then it was 267, I think. So that's a lot of people in my group. I can't just say, hey, hello, quiet, please, please, quiet. 
Where do I start within my group? You're right. Those who sit back next to you? Yeah. I mean, that, that's basically what I did. I started with those who sat next to me, except not those who literally sat next to me. I sat with the other Latvian parliamentarians in my group. At the time, we were three. Now we're four. So I spoke with the other two. Hey, this is a great idea. Very good. I got some ideas on paper. Then where do I go next? So, hey, I now have three out of 267. This is really looking good. Where do you go next? Don't you make the other three to do the same thing you're doing? Oh, that would be wonderful. You could make anyone do anything. It doesn't quite work that way in life. Um, similar interests. Right. So who else has similar interests as I would have, or as Latvia would have? Estonia. Oh, Estonia. You're absolutely right. So I went to my Estonian colleagues and said, hey, Tunikelum, this crazy thing called Mistral, we really have to put, uh, stop this thing. Of course we have to stop this thing. I showed them the papers. This is great. Where did I go next? Monsieur Landsbergis. Landsbergis. Former president. We all call him Mr. President of Lithuania. He sits in the parliament. I spoke with him. I gave him the paper. And he, had, he was the first one who had some written amendments. He wanted to change the text I was working on. Boy, he really made it pound, 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 you know, with all the bad words. And, and I thought, okay, this is a strong. And then I went to the Scandinavians. Swedes are very concerned about what's going on in the, in the Russian military. The latest exercise was bombard Sweden for a nuclear bomb on Denmark. That's not so fun for them. Uh, so so you, get, you can get support there. And slowly I was gaining support. Then I went to the polls. We had 28 polls in our group. And I got the polls on my side because it's really... They have very similar interests to us. They have this long history with, with Russia, which is uh, you know, um, similar to Latvia's. And, uh, and so I finally had all these people support, and then I did the map. And I believe the number was 43 or 44 MEPs out of 267. I had spent a month. I had a text as well. I mean, it wasn't just a, a, I had a text for a, a, a motion for a, 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 a resolution. Is 43 enough? No, because 43 out of 754 is, is a small percentage. Uh, out of 267, it's not enough either. Where would you go next? OK, you, you've, you, you've picked all the low-hanging fruit. That's picked. You have that. Everyone's supporting, hitting me on the shoulders. Great drinking coffee. You know, I felt like a hero. Um, where do you go next? You have to continue making. So I, I, I realized that in my political group, there's one group, one delegation, which stands out above all the others because of their sheer size. Germany. Germany. I believe we have 49 Germans in my group. There are 100 parliamentarians. Half of them in our, are in our group. All Angela Merkel's faithful, faithful followers. Uh, very good people. But how do you speak to 49 Germans? That's a lot of coffee. I can't drink that much coffee or beer. So how would you go about it? You want to convince all the, there are more Germans than there are in this room. I want to convince all of you of something. And they're not willing to come to an auditorium. You know, I, I've arranged for, to convince you of this great thing. They're all busy people. Split them in groups. Right. So I split them in groups in my head. And I did a little homework to find out how they are organized, because Germans I thought to myself, well, if anyone in this parliament is very organized, it has to be the Germans. And lo and behold, I was correct. But the Germans are very organized. They have parliamentarians in every single committee in parliament because there are so many of them. We don't have enough Latvians to cover even all committees. <laughs> and we, we are solo in each committee, uh, in two committees. There, there are more committees than, than, than there are people, but they have two or three or four in each committee. And then I found out who were the parliamentarians working on the Defense Committee, which is the sub subcommittee of uh, foreign affairs, and then who was the top dog? I got a hold of the top dog. I went to him. I went to him with a text, invited him for probably a coffee, uh, and uh, that's right, it's probably a coffee. And I told him my idea. And uh, I showed him the text, and he says, look, for this thing to fly, we have to get all of our group to agree. And our group includes Sarkozy's French. Mm -hmm. Sarkozy's France, well, Sarkozy is the guy selling the Mistral <laughs> ships. 
right? He's in my party. I'm actually going against someone within my own party. That's a little tough thing to do. I knew this, of course, but I said, yeah, hmm, you're really right. He said, what can we do about this? He says, we have to improve this text. I said, of course we have to improve this text. So we spent quite a bit of time improving the text. And he, and he got some other Germans to, you know, who were more interested on this, and, and we changed the text again. But what happens when two of us work on the same text? A marvelous thing happens. That text belongs to you as well as to me, because you've worked on it. It's the idea of inclusiveness. If you ever work in a group project and you want someone to cooperate with you, by God, bring them in and let them also participate in the work. They will not only work, they'll feel that it's theirs and they'll defend it and they'll defend you when the time comes. Right? So many of you are going to be lawyers, you're going to be in, in tough firms. Uh, this solo stuff, that's, that's, I'm sorry, I'll say crap. You have to work together with people in all fields. That's really the way the world works. Uh, but now I had the German, the Germans, in effect, on my side. Uh, but we still needed to crack the toughest nut, the French. Because if we could convince the French, then the Italians and the Spanish, because it really doesn't apply to them, oh, they'll agree anyway. So how would you go about convincing the French? It's their prime minister who's making this sale, trying to help his dying shipbuilding industry. Each ship's sale price 700, 800 million euros. Three ships are ordered. You know, it's like saying, stop, you don't, France doesn't need investments. So how would you go about convincing the French? You're in my shoes. You know the structure. You have to get them on board. Well, how many people live in France? A couple of million. No, a couple of million people live in Latvia. Uh, some 60 million people live in France, some 80 million people live in Germany. But what happens, and this is also a very important thing to understand about dynamics and group dynamics, if you represent a thousand people and you represent five people, when you two come together for a closed meeting, how many people are in that room? A thousand and five? Wrong. Two. There are two people in that room. So what I needed to do is a situation where I would be in the majority even though I represent only two million people and I have to convince someone who represents 60 million people. The way I did it was I invited my German friend, because we had become good friends. We had a few meetings and not all of it was coffee related. I arranged a meeting for the three of us. Now it was me and the German on one side, and the Frenchman, because they, they have a similar structure as the Germans, it turns out. Got the, 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 got the, the French MEP responsible for security issues, sort of as, as our third partner. Two against one. It really, really works that way. Because in a conversation, people forget. Or it, it, it doesn't have that primary role. That primary role comes to voting time. But on argument building time, it's just who's ever in the, in the room. If you have a good argument, uh, you can make a hell of an impression uh, putting yourself in the right auditorium. Make the auditorium fit you. Don't try to fit yourself to the auditorium. So the two of us now sat down with my French friend. We're all friends. We, we talk about that way in the party. Oh, our Italian friends, our French friends, our socialist friends, our communist friends. We're all friends. We disagree like hell, but we're all friends. So we're sitting with our French friend, and what does our French friend say? He pulls on the hairs on his head, and he says, Sarkozy will kill me if I support this. You have to understand that. I mean, it, it makes sense, because what, what the text had come down to was, in armament sales, European member states have to adhere to the treaty which says no sales to third countries without full consent of the council. France circumvented the council. It did a big no-no. It broke the law or the treaty. So what, what we wanted was something quite sane. Please adhere to the treaty. It's, it's, it's really not a far-fetched argument. But in reality, it means 
No shipbuilding jobs in the port city of France where these ships are going to be built. Sarkozy is going to kick me out of that. I'm not going to become a parliamentarian anymore. I'm not even going to be in local municipal elections. I'm going to be sweet, uh, scraping the sweets again, uh, st- sweeping the streets again. This is not going to be a good life. And so the two of us, and me in particular, I said, yeah. So how can we overcome this? And when you put something not as a hit them on the head, but as a, okay, what sort of solution can we find? There's usually a solution to every problem. I have not encountered any problem where there's no solution. Every problem has a solution. Sometimes it's a little tough to see. Sometimes you need resources that are a little tough to get. But every situation has a solution. I know of no situation, no circumstances where there's absolutely zero option. There's always an option. It may not be a pleasant option, but there's always an option. So what we did, the German, the Frenchman, and me, sounds like a joke, right? We rewrote once again. And the, I, uh, we had put in, uh, how should we say, I don't remember now off the top of my head, say seven or eight points. I was willing to bargain away all but one or two of these points because it really didn't matter. They didn't change the, the, the essence of, of, of the argumentation. The French were, we have to strike point three and strike point five. And so, over a negotiation, I agreed to strike point three and point five, which really, that cost me nothing. It, that didn't matter. You have, to, you have to overstuff your demands so that you can always have a, a route to retreat. You have to do that, you're, if, especially if you're going to be lawyers. I think my client really shouldn't go to jail all too long. It's probably not the best way to start. You should probably say my client is completely innocent and deserves to walk out of this courtroom right now. And then you hope to get maybe five years instead of 35. I mean, you, you start this way. That's, that's, that's life. I'm sure you're being taught that in, in, your, in your law classes. I, I certainly hope you are. Otherwise, I would want you as my lawyer. Um, you want a lawyer who's going to fight your corner. That's what we politicians are, you understand. I'm a pit bull elected by the electorate to fight their fight, to fight in their corner. I am fighting to get this resolution debated in Parliament. No holds barred. My gloves are off. I'm smiling but I'm fighting just as viciously as any lawyer does in a courtroom. And so we got this Frenchman to rewrite this with us. And what had now happened? Who did this proposal belong to now? Maybe. Yeah. So not only all the Balts and the Scandinavians and the Poles and, and our, our sort of, I could say, default allies on this issue, but all the Germans and the French. And of course, I did some more talks with individuals. It was a process that took about six months covering all the bases, spending a lot of time speaking, arguing, sending texts back and forth. There's a lot of details I'm I'm glossing over. When it came to the final decision within our political group of whether we would support this or not, I had worked uh, with, uh, he's now the the foreign minister of Cyprus, Mr. Kasoulidis. At the time, he was was the head of the the political subgroup organizing uh, foreign affairs. Mr. Kasoulidis told me, Flat out, he says, you get the Germans and the French, I'll get you the rest. But I can't, you know. And so I came to him and I said, Monsieur Casoulides, nous avons des Allemands et des Français. And he said, this is a very good thing. And he put it on the agenda, because a good chairman only puts things on the agenda that have a chance of getting through. You you don't want to put things that you know people aren't going to disagree. When the meeting came up, I had arranged for 10 of us to be in the room, including the German and the Frenchman, by the way, that if there's going to be a debate, we're all going to stand up and, and argue that, no, this is in the interest of the EPP, of the center-right. We have to get this on the agenda in Parliament. But what did Mr. Casalides do? He's a smart man as well. That's why he's the foreign minister of Cyprus. What a country to be foreign minister of these days, huh? just occurred to me. Um, uh, he's reading the agenda. He says, OK, point five. Uh, Mr. Kadinsch has a resolution that he's moving through together with, and he reads a few last names, the German and the Frenchman at the top, because that's how I arranged the last names. And he says, well, this has been cleared at all political levels. Is there any objection? People here, the magic politicians, it's been cleared at all political levels, and you fall asleep, to my advantage. And the group accepted it. Now, what had just happened? I got the accept. I had effectively had 267 votes now in favor of this. It's shy of the majority needed for the parliament, but it's a big plus, because the next step 
is out of my direct control. Now the, the head of our group, the president of our group, has to go to the other groups. They have presidency meetings where they fight with each other on what's going to be on the agenda. And there they fight. How do they fight? They don't really fight, although our chairman, he's, he could probably pull a few as well. But uh, um, uh, you bargain. You want this, I want that, okay, this for that, we'll give you this if you give us that. that that's how it works. That's, that's how politics works. Does anyone know who the president of the center-right is and was at the time? He's still the president. His name is Joseph Daub. And guess from which country he comes from? Joseph. Yeah. He's from Alsace. He's from Strasbourg. Uh, he's a Frenchman. I now had a Frenchman fighting for a resolution against the interests of France on my side. It was the most beautiful feeling I had had in many, many a, a long time. Uh, but to, to secure matters, of course, I didn't just leave it to good old Joseph to fight the fight. I spent time working, especially in the socialists and the Greens, where there would be the biggest possible uh, 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 desire to slow this thing down, speaking with individual MEPs uh, from various countries, in including from Germany, not only from the, from the Baltics and the Scandinavia, but working with the Germans, especially the Germans. It went to the agenda. It went to plenary. It was a, a formal debate with the world press, or at least the, Europe press, the European press there. Uh, 40-odd uh, MEPs got a chance to debate. That's a lot of time, because uh, time is very sparse uh, in the plenary sessions. They last one week, it sounds very much, but everyone wants to have debating time. We got debating time, and the European Parliament, including MEPs from Germany, France, and all others, all political groups, everyone said with a single voice, in sales of arms, we have to adhere to the uh, common uh, European security goals, which are stated in the, in the agreements, and you cannot make any sales circumventing uh, the uh, uh, European Council. It's a long story. It was designed to be long to fill up a little bit of time. Um, but I hope you got the sense of what it means to move something through. Uh, there, there's a, yeah, I don't see chalk. I don't need the chalk. Oh, here's some. I don't want to erase these. These are very You're important. Welcome. You're welcome. Uh, it's okay? Yeah. Okay. No more equilibrium here. No. Nope. It's gone. There really is no equilibrium anyway. You either make the sale or you don't, and then you have to make the next one. Okay. It's very important. Okay, lots of attention. It's pretty tough. Your second year, I'm sure you can handle it. Eighty twenty. There's an eighty twenty rule, I'm sure you're being taught all kinds of manner. That twenty percent of my clients make eighty percent of my profits. Uh, it was true in my business, although it was more like ten percent of my clients made 90% of my profits. Uh, what's the 80-20 rule that I'm speaking about? You get to be third year, see if you can answer this. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an economic, so that is exactly. That's, that's usually how it is. 20% of your customers generate 80% of your profits. And as I said, in my business, I used to manufacture ice in the, in the frozen foods business. It was more like 10 and 90. But... Uh, can you imagine what this could refer to in the European Parliament? Probably won't. Sorry? Won't. Okay, that's 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 about as close as that. Can you get closer? No, I wanted to say the idea that even small groups and small states can achieve, uh, let's say, eighty percent of the, the turnovers. Eighty percent of parliamentarians, and this is my finding in any group, in most groups of people, about twenty percent, one fifth, are pretty active and moving things along, and the other four fifths are sort of cruising along. It's kind of fun. I don't want to say they're lazy, but they're happy to have someone else take the initiative. Twenty percent are moving, eighty percent are enjoying that someone else is moving. It makes them look good as well. So, what's 20% of 754? You're all 
experts in numbers. Who can do that math? 10% of 754 is 75. Two times 75 is? Yeah. That is the number of true competition that I have in Parliament. I don't have all 754 because all 754 are not equally active. It's just the truth. No offense to anyone. It's just, it, it's just how things work. So if you fit and you position yourself as someone who's going to be moving and active, you actually have far less competition than you think you have or that people from the outside think you have. How can you do that? Well, it's, it's, it's really not rocket science. Just don't be lazy. Not being lazy puts you at a hell of a... Have your final exams... They're not, when are your final exams this year? Next. Next week. Next week. So I remember when I was a student, uh, I had a strategy in how to get good grades. I, I, when I finished uh, high school, I was, uh, how should we say, uh, a strong average student. Uh, my mother, for a time, was a little concerned whether I would even go to college and what I would do in that college besides drink beer. Um, I played with a band. I, I, I enjoyed myself. I played sports. I enjoyed other things that people who play in bands and play sports do. Um, but when I got to college, uh, when I turned 18, uh, 18, I sort of woke up and I realized, holy moly, uh, this is my life. And then I developed a strategy, sort of intuitively. I didn't read anything clever about how to do this, but I'm trying to tell you all of my great wisdoms and, and secrets that I've employed. I noticed that when springtime came around, a remarkable thing happened on the college green. What happens on campuses the world over, I'm sure it happens in Riga, when the weather is nice? What are people, young people, doing when the weather is nice? They're going outside in the sun. Because, you know, it's been a long winter, it's really crummy weather, and finally it's nice, and, and sort of the, the winter clothing comes off, and, and people can see more of each other, and, 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 you know, these things just sort of happen. But, see, if you sort of pace yourself, and you start in the beginning of a se at the beginning of semester to read, to do the workload, to, to follow along, and before exam time, if you don't start drinking, I, when I was a student, there weren't these Red Bulls, and these things I think are actually very hazardous to your health. I would strongly not recommend these things. But, uh, you know, instead of trying to cram in the last two or three days, if you've all the time held up and you simply, when everyone else is going outside, you continue working, what happens? The curve decreases, you stay the same, all of a sudden the difference, the delta between you and the curve, means that you get really, really good grades, because all grades in the end are averaged uh, or compared to each other, right? The best and the worst, they can compare in the class. That's the A, that's the F, everyone else in the middle, you know, where the bell curve comes out. So this is the strategy that I also use uh, in Parliament. Um, I'm in the 20%, I consider myself, uh, and I'm going to stay in that 20%. It doesn't mean I don't sleep. I sleep. I exercise. Uh, I have the occasional beer, but you just don't don't give up. You, 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 you take a pace and you hit it and you can hold it. It's like a marathon. You, know, you, can, you can hold it for a very, very long time. That's the way to get influence. You don't, don't sit on your laurels. Don't sit on your hands. Don't, and don't, for God say, oh, you know, the world is so unjust. There's so many Germans. There's so few Latins. Why is it so unjust? Who the heck wants to hear that? Do you think a German wants to hear how unjust the world is? No. He thinks the world is unjust because he's, he's paying for his grandfather's sins, two of them, in the wars. I mean, everyone has a gripe to gripe. Who doesn't have a gripe to gripe? But if you gripe it, you're at best in the 80, and you are out the door. You know, you may as well stay asleep. Why wake up? Why go to work? So, you play, you, you've played sports. You, all, you, you have a mandatory sports here in this? No. No mandatory should be. Okay. <laughs> Imagine now I'm not dressed in a suit. I'm dressed in, a, in football attire. Because this is really just a, it's just a uniform. If I was in the greens, I would have longer hair and round glasses, maybe some sandals. I'm in the center right, so I have a dark suit with a dark tie. It's just a uniform. But imagine I'm dressed in the uniform of a, of a, of a football player, and I'm on the defense. I'm on the right side of the goal. This, this is the goal. And uh, 
I'm on the field like this. I look really cool, right? <laughs> on the other side, on the left, is another guy. He's dressed just the way I'm dressed. I mean, you know, appropriately. He's standing like this. He looks, he really does look cool. Maybe he has good muscles and everything. But he's standing like this. And now the ball's coming, you know, more or less down the middle. Which one of us has the best chance of getting to that ball? It's sort of a rhetorical question. <laughs> of course, it's this guy. Uh, because he's moving, right? I mean, you've all learned that in sports. The trainer says, don't stand on your heels. You know, if, I mean, you can't, you can't move if you're in this position. Because first you have to shift onto your toes, and then you have to kind of get lumber. And the ball, you know, it's gone. The play is over. Hell, you know, what are you doing? Get the water. Get the towels. Get out of here. Uh, the people who take this approach in life, and many of them have graduated from very fine institutions, uh, achieve nothing. But you all should take advantage of them, because that's the 80%. Get them on your side. If you show initiative, they'll say, yeah, that's good. No, oh, yeah. Be in the 20. Be in the 20. Stay in the 20. You can do a hell of a lot. And you're never disadvantaged. You're only disadvantaged as far as, as, as you tell yourself that you're disadvantaged. And if you tell yourself that, out the door. Don't do it. Don't bother. Go to sleep. Why go to class? Why take the job? You're just going to get fired anyway. You know? Take it easy. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, what I want to say. You can influence. I have more stories on things that I've done since that time. That was the first big one that I, I realized, that you really can put all these things in, in practice. Uh, but you, you have to put in that effort. But put in putting in that, use your mind. Try not to you know, waste your effort where it's, where it's useless. Uh, pointed, pointed uh, activity. And you can achieve a hell of a lot. And that's how a politician from a, a relatively small country, we're large compared to Malta, Cyprus, Luxembourg, you know, we're a huge country. We're bigger than Denmark in land mass. Okay, the Danes have a few million on us, but after the Russians put that atom bomb on you, you know, <laughs> they won't, they won't. Um, that was a little over the top humor. But uh, 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 you really can do a lot. Uh, now that your turn, time to take an initiative to put forward your questions. Yeah, yeah, so you've been listening for 40 minutes to this mindless things that what, what is it that actually interests you? Mm. Yes? Have you heard this concept of parliamentarization? parliamentarization? No. Because this is uh, one of the theoretical questions which we covered uh, in the last seminar and I just wanted to ask uh, if you use these theories also in your practical work. Um. But maybe try to summarize very briefly. What, what does it mean? Because I'm sure that the, the sense I understand, I just don't know the, the terminology for what you're talking about. It's a part, it builds part of the European Union integration process. And uh, it's a way how the EU Parliament um, uh, makes these core decisions with the Council. And, uh, I, I just wanted to know if you really, in your practical work, uh, work uh, daily uh, working life, if you uh, ever use these theories, for example, neo-functionalism or parliamentarization? Um, you have to understand that being a politician and being a political scientist is a similar relationship as being an entrepreneur and being an economist. Economists observe what entrepreneurs do, and then they write theories that try to explain how economies actually work as they're working or in the past as they have worked. So what can we learn, what, what can we transpose from the understanding of the Great Depression to the crisis of today? Is Keynesian, is the Keynesian approach the right way or the wrong way? Uh, and there's lots of heated debate. Uh, similarly in politics, uh, politicians are in the game of uh, working on the here and now, trying to improve, that's the idea, uh, the circumstances of, of citizens of nations by changing certain laws, either making them more strict or the opposite, making them more lax, introducing them or striking them off the books. Uh, how political scientists describe the process that we're doing, uh, I'm not a political scientist. I hold a doctoral degree in linguistics. I was a uh, natural language uh, 
uh, uh, speech recognition uh, specialists. I worked on the technologies that have your iPhone Siri that you can talk to. I worked on these technologies in the 1990s that were teaching the machines to understand what the hell we're saying. So I'm not trained theoretically in political science. Um, but what you're, what you're alluding to, sort of how parliament interacts with council, that's bread and butter. It's the question that we have, how the hell can we get this through? How can we get something through council? I had this experience. I, I was the rapporteur, the head, the, head uh, uh, the person responsible for legislation, which it's now enacted, that requires member states to disclose their uh, 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 slepens. Who could? Yeah, their secret, their secret, or, or their non-public agreements with third energy providers. We in Parliament wanted this very strongly. When I went to Trialog, that process that tries to put together the Council and the Parliament's position, it was the Danish presidency at the time. I met with the Danish uh, uh, Minister of Economic Affairs. The, da the Danes wanted this legislation passed just as much as the Latvians and the Finns and the Swedes, but Germany, France, and Italy said, no way in hell, we don't want this legislation at all. So I was, this is another one of my experiences, I'm responsible for the, I'm res representing the entire parliament in the, in the negotiation, hitting across the problem of, boy, the parliament wants something, the council doesn't want something. So we use all kinds of clever political argumentations to make it impossible for the council to refuse our offer. In the process, I lost the entire left of the parliament, and then I had to scramble to retain the votes, and I got it through with 60, 61%. But that's, that's our bread and butter. What you're being taught from the theoretical point, I'm certain that that's exactly how it works. But it, it doesn't feel like these abstract phrases. It means, how the hell can we convince Germany, who wants to have their, their, their secret protocols with Russia, remain secret, uh, because they get better prices out of the deal, but we in the East suffer, how can we get them to agree to us? One way to follow up on, 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 on the question, but I, I think you've already in a way un answered it, would be historically, it's often just described that there's been this period where the parliament has been fighting for more power, oh. and been gaining more power. And one way of put, put putting the question is whether that ever is part of the collective consciousness of, of the parliament, Absolutely. we are on the warpath for more power, Absolutely. or whether it is actually the individual cases that are, uh, are fought about which then result in, in more power. Oh, actually. From, from, from this side, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood uh, your question, if, if, this is, this, if that was what you're talking about. Correct. Uh, parliament is always fighting for more recognition, uh, and is very thankful for the, for the last Lisbon agreement, which now on as a result of which we have co-legislative decisions. In the previous parliament, I, w I was a member of the Latvian parliament at the time, the European parliament was a talking shop. We think we want, it's sort of like with the Mistral. You, you can get a big political message, but you actually cannot change the result. Now, I move through actual legislation which requires member states to do something in spite of big member state objections because of the power of co-decision. What Parliament would next want is the power of initiative. Why the hell do we have to wait on the Council to initiate legislation? We're politicians. We're directly elected from European citizens. We want to initiate legislation. So the Parliament is always fighting for more power. And member states, especially some member states, are always fighting against this because it's the question of what should the European balance be? How federal should it be? And how, how confederal should it be? And this is a it's a it's a big topic on a daily basis that that people spend sometimes in our in our meetings we, we spend two hours debating these things. I consider them little hot air debates because at the end of the day, it's the concrete steps that you need to that you need to take. So yes, we're extremely aware of this as an institution, and we're extremely jealous. So in the multiannual fiscal framework, the member states got together. And they said, we're going to reduce costs by 5% over the next seven years. The Parliament has been saying, together with the Commission, this is insane. You cannot, on the basis of a short-term crisis, lock yourself into a, a smaller European budget, which is less than 1% of GDP anyway. And the, the Council said, well, you're just the Parliament. 
and so they did not, we, we had five representatives elected from the parliament to represent us in these, in these uh, debates. They were not giving, on the debates on the budget, were not giving parliament any figures. We'll debate, but only on ideas. Is cohesion a good thing? <laughs> what, what are we talking about? How much money are we talking about? And so what happens now, parliament has said, okay, you didn't listen to us. Now, how should we say, read between the lines. We will not ratify, because without parliament's consent, there is no multi-annual budget. So Europe is now hung right now, because council refused to acknowledge parliament's role, and parliament is forcing its role by being obstinate. And what does parliament want as an institution? Talk to us. If you ignore us, we will vote against it. And right now there's a big tug of war on what the actual multi-annual fiscal framework, what the budget will be. And one of the good things is, is we've managed, I among others, that parliament is fighting for, for more cohesion funds for Latvia. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little pleasantry. Uh, I'm glad that the parliament is being obstinate because one of the things that could result is maybe a little more money for us in the process. That's not the goal, but you kind of you have to know as a politician when to when to tag something on to a good thing. So there's a lot of institutional fighting. It's polite, but it's it's very real. One question? 80%, 20%? Yeah. So when we're talking about uh, enhancing the uh, power of the parliament, and then there's the other side. It's uh, the low and decreasing number of uh, people who are participating in elections. So my question is, how, how does the parliament look at this, and how does the parliament uh, try to tackle this problem? Oh, one of the ways the parliament is tackling the problem is that next European elections will be held not in June, but in May, <laughs> in the vain hope that more people will come because fewer people will be on holiday. <laughs> Um, I, I laugh because I, I find that uh, rather silly. Uh, there's a big disconnect in Europe. Uh, there's a, sm relatively speaking, a small political class, including heads of government, opposition, position, who understand that globally, uh, Europe is fighting for power and influence vis-a-vis -vis the United States, China, India, uh, Brazil, Argentina, South America. And if we don't get our act together, we will slowly, we run the risk of becoming somewhat irrelevant. Because Europe is not currently the center of dynamic innovation. Europe is the center of dramatic decline. Aging populations, very stiff rules, very slow to react. The US, thanks to its immigration policy or its lack of immigration policy or its millions of illegal immigrants, I don't know how to say that correctly, they have a very young medium age, which is more comparable to Asia than to Europe. Uh, they are quite competitive. They have a very free uh, labor market. Uh, from a European standpoint, it seems that they have no laws uh, protecting workers. From an American point of view, um, there's really not so much as a problem of long-term un unemployment as, as in Europe because the labor market is so liquid. If you lose one job, you easily get another job because from the employer point of view, there's no risk of hiring you. I don't have to, you're not a lifetime employee. So uh, it's a more liquid market. There's lots of debate whether you think that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, China, India, these are growing. And if Europe doesn't pull itself more together, we're going to be left out of the game. But the problem is, is that as most politicians understand, and analysts understand that this is a, a requirement uh, European citizens feel just the opposite. We don't need more Europe, we need less Europe. Our problems stem from Europe. Those damn Brussels bureaucrats, they're just hampering our lives with all their silly demands and their regulations and directives. If we just had less of that, life would be better. That's the sentiment across populations. So we are in a big, uh, a big uh, uh, disjoint between what politicians want and what citizens want. And so what the European Parliament would want in terms of uh, gaining more interest at, or having people care about the Parliament is increasing our powers so that people will understand what well, you, you should care about those people who are going to legislate the laws you, all, you have to live with anyway. And so you have the, the three houses, right? You have mm -hmm. the uh, European Council, mm -hmm. the... European Commission, where they both come out the same, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
the European European Parliament. In Latvian, it's these two are the same, isn't it? Um, that right now you have direct representation, direct and proportional representation in Parliament. So one Latvian MEP represents some uh, 200,000 voters, one German MEP represents some 2 million voters. So it, it, it's, it, it's a big difference on, on what country, but there's a proportional digression where the most after the next uh, uh, election will be 90, 96, I think 96 for Germany is the maximum and six the minimum for Malta, Estonia, uh, Cyprus and the others. And everyone else will be kind of squeezed into a ladder. We'll have eight, uh, a ladder in between. But on the council side, how does a federal government work? How does Germany's federal government work? Do you know? Or the US? Representation. Upper house, lower house. How do they tend to work? Well, there's a federal government, and then well, in Germany's case, there are these um, separate lender that operate almost uh, on their own, but still they have this uh, connection to the. You have the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. You know this, right? Who is a member of the Bundestag? What is the Bundestag? It's the Parliament of Germany. The people who are directly elected from, from uh, electoral regions to be representatives who sit in Berlin. And then you have the Bundesrat, which are representatives of the Länder, where there is a relation two to one. The big Länder get six seats, and the smaller lender get three seats each. So it's not quite a one-on-one -on -one sort of one, one, uh, one country or one lender, one vote, but it's, it's sort of close. The US, this would be the Senate in the US, this would be the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives in the US has a directly proportional number of representatives which has everything to do with the number of people, demographics, people living in each state. There are 50 states. So each state has different numbers of representatives. In the Senate, each state gets two places. Even a small, I grew up in the US in Delaware. 360,000 people? I don't know. I, it's, a very, it's the second smallest state. Has two representatives, one of which is now currently the vice president of the US, uh, 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 Biden. And uh, uh, that's the same number of representatives as California has, which has some 70, 80 million. It's roughly the size of Germany. So that's how federal systems tend to work. You have one chamber, which is proportional to inhabitant numbers. You have a second chamber, which is sort of from each region, the same number. But in Europe, we don't have that. We have proportional representation here and proportional voting here. So Latvia has four votes, and Germany has 26, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so it's uh, uh, six, six, six times more. Uh, votes, six, six to one, uh, Germany to Latvia, more proportional to inhabitant size. So what the parliament is fighting for is we need a treaty change in Europe which would mandate that this mm -hmm. remains a proportional house and this becomes a one country, one vote house in its ideal form. And as a politician, I'd be willing to say, Okay, Germany has two, we have one, so us and Estonia together make up one Germany. That's fine with me as well. But you understand the idea. So there's lots of talk even among politicians on what the correct architecture is, but I'm convinced that if we had such an architecture, people would be caring a lot more for the European Parliament because its role and its ability to influence and also what is our role in the European Council, it would be actually greatly enhanced. Small countries would gain, larger countries would lose a little bit. And that's why the large countries don't like this. <laughs> it's a bad idea. If you were a German politician, why the hell would you want to give up your voting rights to some Maltese politician? I mean, you can understand that sentence. So there's a lot of fight within the institutions. It's an ongoing process. Europe is a project. Um, before the European Union or uh, the European Economic Community, uh, there was the Second World War. And before the Second World War, there was the First World War. And before the First World War, there were myriad wars between countries, sort of regional wars. Everyone's slugging it out with each other. 
And before those big wars, they're just a bunch of people slugging out with each other anyway. Uh, so Europe is a history of conflict. And thanks to the structure since the Second World War, we've had one of the longest periods of peace. Uh, maybe you'd have to go back to the Roman times uh, uh, without any uh, wars uh, in Europe. We argue now. It's pleasant. We smile. Um, that's better than tanks rolling down the street and blasting off buildings. So it's not a perfect structure, but it's a hell of a lot better than war. And what it means for a small country like ours is, or, or Denmark uh, or Belgium, that it's a lot better to be at the table negotiating with, say, Germany or France than to have their tanks rolling across our territory and then telling us what to do. I mean, even Denmark experienced a few uh, brief but unpleasant years of Nazi occupation during the war. Any other questions about what it's like to fly every week back and forth? Yeah? Um, do you see the European Union becoming a federal state? Not until people want it, no. I see no chance of that. Uh, and I actually see that there's a, because of the economic crisis and the, the diminishing national treasuries, Europe is right now, or the, the European project, if you could call it, is at one of its most precarious states. Uh, even in Germany and France, which are traditional staunch European idea supporters, there's now a new party in Germany. We'll see how they do in the federal elections. Alternative for Deutschland. So, uh, you know, if, if the euro is good for the Greeks, okay, let them stay, we're out of here. Right. So, and this sort of thinking from a small country like ours is, is, should be ringing all kinds of concern bells in your head because for a small country, our security and our economic well-being is dependent upon a peaceful neighborhood. And if that neighborhood starts to wobble, that's not so good for our country because you, know, you just have to read you know, two pages back in the history books. We know what an unstable neighborhood can mean to us. Last time around, I'm in 50 years of occupation. You know, that, that's not a good deal. On top of four years of German occupation, on top of one year of, of the first Soviet occupation. That's really not, not a fun place to be. And you look at events that happen in Russia. I think a country like ours has to pay close attention to that. We can pretend that we don't care or it doesn't apply to us, but it does. It's a neighbor. We have a, a land border with them. And Russia is moving... I don't know if you can move faster away from democracy, if, if there's such a way to describe that, but, you know, Mr. Putin is certainly not enacting democratic reforms. He has now effectively made NGOs foreign agents and putting them on trial, throwing opponents into jail. Um, you know, not, 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 a very, not a very encouraging sign to us. Uh, so if we have a, an effect, an unstable regional partner. Russia, I think, is unstable. Unstable because the entire middle class is opposed to the ruling class. So the ruling class, Putin and, and his type, cannot rely on the citizens of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but have to rely on the support of the, shall we say, further from the center, probably a little lower on the educational ladder and the economic ladder, on sort of how to keep their support. And the way you keep their support is always fighting external enemies. And it should be disconcerting that the biggest concentration of Russian forces uh, outside of the area of, of Syria right now is on the northwestern border, <laughs> by our border. A new air base is being planned uh, in the, the Pleskova, the Beskov uh, region. Uh, they want to sign an agreement with Belarus on putting an air base there, a squadron with 60 fighter planes. We have two NATO planes circling over our three countries right now. Uh, so it really is a concern, and the way that we counter this is with a strong union, a strong union. But if citizens don't want this, that's something that we really have to be concerned about. And I don't think that a country like ours would have anything to lose from a federal Europe, a United States of Europe. I see we have nothing to lose, plenty to gain, but I know that my electorate does not want to hear that. Um, because people don't understand that. Because people, people understand that as, what am I going to lose? It's like joining the euro. What are people afraid of? 
when I, I speak on a weekly basis, I meet with people, and one of the big issues, especially among pensioners, is on mo moving to the euro. Uh, does anyone here think it's a good idea for this country to move to the euro? Anyone think it's a really bad idea? You're not going to admit it, but, um, but pensioners are afraid because the last time money was changed, they lost money. Right? So their experience from changing currencies means losing. So if I'm going to lose, I'm going to be opposed. But they, they don't have a full appreciation of what that change this time around means. We're not creating a new currency. We're just folding the lot into the euro, which already exists. But that's a, you have to really think for a moment to understand that. And it's the same with, with European structures. You can say, oh, this is, this is awful. We'll lose our identity. OK, what's the real geopolitical alternative? You know, the word, we're, there's only two players in our neighborhood. It's the East and the West. Take your, play, take your pick. You know, I'll go with the West. And if you go with the West, well, you want to have this structure be strong. But it's not very strong right now, because citizens are not understanding it. They're not understanding the benefits. And they're growing sort of in in being upset with their governments and upset with austerity, they're also being upset with Europe. It's sort of the baby and bathwater issue. There are plenty of problems around, but not all of them stem from the fact that we have a European Union. Has there been any discussion of how it could be improved, the situation among the citizens? I mean, it's, it just sounds like they're misinformed or not enough informed about the work. And this is, I think it's been a topic as long as the, the European Parliament has been in existence. Uh, one of my colleagues, Astrid Luling, has been working in some form or proto-form of the European Parliament since 1967. She's now over 80 years old. I was born in 64, so she's been there since the time I was three. Uh, that's a long time. And I understand from Astrid, she's from Luxembourg, that uh, sort of these issues have been long-standing. They're, they're always there. How can you... How can, you, how can you get across to people that it's actually a good thing? Because it seems that those people who read more and understand more and participate become fans of it because you understand it. But that understanding is, is, is not going through. And, and that's our fault. That's the political classes, including my own fault, why people are not understanding it more. Uh, so apparently no one has yet quite figured out what the magic key uh, on getting that me message through is, and if, if you or anyone else has that magic key, you have a marvelous career in front of you. Well, uh, about the Euro thing, there is going to be some campaigns and everything in UK to inform and to, to like reassure that it's going to be safe and stuff. So why isn't it like something similar you know, to, to make up this for government as well? Um. Regarding our government's campaign on the euro, I think that things are going far too slow and, and should have been started yeah, six months ago at the latest. Uh, but certainly it seems that in every auditorium that I've been in, when you spend 20 minutes speaking with people, you start with an auditorium which is hostile to the idea, and you end with an auditorium which is, oh, okay. Well, I'm not excited about it, but actually it probably sounds like a good thing, which is already a lot better. And we see in the opinion polls that Everyone used to be opposed, and now the numbers are somewhat climbing, although they're not at all encouraging. Uh, uh, how to get, and that's a concrete message, you know, on, on, on your wallet, which is, in a sense, easier to, to argue about, because it, there are economic fundamentals, et cetera, that you can kind of fall back on. But on an idea of where are our places in the world and that we need this structure outside of us making decisions. That's how people feel because people have a sense that I can't influence that. But my message is, is of course you can. Well, you can influence it by voting for or against me or any other politician. But whoever you vote for, and please vote, make sure that you vote for that son of a bitch who's going to be fighting your corner. That's what you have to be looking for. And people generally don't do that, they vote for people who seem very pleasant. And unfortunately, many of my pleasant colleagues, I don't mean from my country, but many pleasant colleagues I see who fit into that 80% are probably extremely nice people, and they win all sorts of popularity contests at home, but they're not doing anything for their country. That's my personal opinion. But I use them, so they support me. That's good. Good for me, bad for them. But uh, it's sort of this understanding, it's, it's also an understanding in society, what is a politician besides someone to hate? So. 
I take it as a given that everyone hates politicians. We're just a bunch of freeloaders, non-productive, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that's the way that uh, um, representative democracy works, uh, is that we are, we're like lawyers. We have to fight, we have to be able to fight a cause and to vote for or against anyone, you should understand what corner they're fighting and then give that person your support. Or those of you who are interested to joining that fight, get involved. I would say to you, you're all young, finish your studies, work for some years. Five years, 10 years, come in when you're 30. You're very young for a politician at 30 and you'll have experience and you'll have a point of view and you'll have something to fall back on, sort of a life experience from what you've been doing before. I've noticed that those who try to go into politics directly from school, from uh, university, many of them have many of them lack that real experience coming from something. They're, you know, the, the people who've been teachers, who've been doctors, who've been lawyers, who've been consultants, they have real life experience outside of politics that they can relate to and bring that experience into the legislative process. If you lack that, then you really have nothing to add except, except theory, book theory. And quite frankly, that book theory is interesting, but it's not going to bring home the bacon. It's the application of that book theory, and that you can only get from working. And also, uh, sometimes uh, people uh, even who are teaching cannot explain it. If they don't have any space with these practical uh, examples hmm. and situations. I suppose. I suppose. There was a time when I thought I wanted to be a university professor. Uh, I actually came to Latvia thinking I'm going to be a university professor. The University of Latvia shut me out through various means. And so I became an entrepreneur, sort of, if no one's going to give me a job, I'll give myself a job. And my entire life course changed. And then I became a politician because the, the former head of the central bank, Mr. Repship, 10, 11, 12 years ago, said, I want to form a new political party with people who are not involved in the old corrupt politics, who have ideas that, that are business friendly. And I got in touch, and that's sort of how this entire thing f started for me. I, I'd never thought about being a politician. But I have lots of experience of being an entrepreneur in Latvia. And I have experience as a trained academic. Sort of I understand that side of things. So work, for me, working in politics is a wonderful fusion of reacting like, a re, uh, like an entrepreneur, but reflecting and reading and, and being logical, or trying to be uh, like an academic. So it's, it's a wonderful, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting fusion. And I speak a few languages, so you you get to use that. It's, it's, one of your, it's part of your toolkit, right? One of my toolkits is the slap on the back, another is the foot in front, the trip, and another is, is the various languages that I use. You have to fight it all. When you go to court, you have to, you have to fight. I want to hire you because you're going to fight the fight. And your clients will hire you because you're going to be in there. Or if you're going to be many of your economists, you're going to be consultants. People don't want a soft consultant who has no opinion. They want someone who can do the analysis and say, this is my recommendation. And then with the recommendation, I can either accept it or reject it, but at least I know what the hell it is you're trying to tell me. So work on it. Have an opinion. Don't be afraid to espouse it. As a matter of fact, the only people that I find interesting are people with opinions. Because if you don't have that opinion, well, why have I wasted my time with you? Why, why, why should I hire you if all you can tell me is everything I know already? I, I know I'm in trouble and I don't know where to go. So I'm going to hire you as a consultant because you'll tell me why I'm in trouble, why you think I'm in trouble. Well, actually, maybe you should adjust your price. What? You know, <laughs> and maybe you can get me out of trouble with actually, it's not a real brain teaser. So you, you have to do that, but you have to have that analysis. That's what you're being trained here for. You're just like in the gym, doing push-ups and jumping jacks. You're being trained here. But that training is going to last you a lifetime. So, you know, take advantage of it. Suck your professors dry, no offense. But, I mean, suck them dry because they're, they really have a lot. That's why they're here. You can, you can take that. Take that. One more question? Yeah. Do you think the Turkish should or should not the European Union. Turkey and European Union expansion. <laughs> do you want my answer? Do you yeah, want the? Uh, I see it as a geopolitical question. 
and I will put it, I'll, I'll put it as a question to you. 80 million Turks sitting pretty in the Middle East. Do you want those 80 million Turks on your side? Or do you want those 80 million Turks, say, on the Iranian side? Your choice. That's how I see it. Because when you look at history, and the history of the Middle East, and the history of, of Turkey, and the history of Iran, of Persia, I mean, that's an ancient civilization that is not just Ahmadinejad, I'm going to blow up the world. That's, that's just, a, uh, I think it's a superficial veneer. There's a lot of power going through. In a big country like Turkey, uh, they have their own internal problems with the Kurds in the east. Uh, so the, the Kurds who live partially in Turkey, partially in Iraq, uh, uh, they're, they're always uh, fighting with them. You have Istanbul, which is Europeanized, and then you have sort of the political class has been for years saying Turkey has to remain a secular, modern state, a.k.a. Ataturk, and we're going to move closer to Europe. But if they're not making that success, I mean, if I've been telling you for years, just follow me and, you know, life's going to get better. And 10 years down the road, you're still following me, you know, whatever, 80% in lack of inertia, uh, lack of initiative, and, sorry, not you, but, but uh, you know, you, you're still following me and life's not better. Well, eventually you're going to say, you know, I don't know, this Cuttings guy, he's kind of stupid, I think. And, you know, maybe this other guy's better. And who's the other guy in Turkey? He's the guy who's saying, we have the Quran. What else do we need? The West doesn't want us, so let's lead the East. So I would say it would be a shrewd and clever move if Europe could figure out a way to swallow that, that, that big kumos. Uh, Jesus, I've forgotten English. What's that? Yeah, but you don't really say it that way. You say it a different way. I can't remember that. But uh, at any rate, to, to swallow, not, not the pride, but to, to get over it and to find a way to bring Turkey closer. I think this is, this is, this is in our interests. But it's a, a minority view among European politicians. European politicians are concerned that they're Muslims, they have different traditions, they're not Europeans. I hear this all the time with my colleagues. They're not Europeans. And I say, that's very good. There's 80 million of them, you know, and it's a question, how do you keep them as your friend if you don't let them into the club? Then they may become your enemy. That's my view. I'm minority view. Are we out of time? Do we have more time? No, no, we have all oh, the time in the world. All the time in the world. <laughs> That's the, big, that's the big problem. The problem is, is if there really are 80 million, of course, Europe would be very interested in actually counting them. And God forbid there is 90 or so. That means they're roughly the size of Germany. If Germany has 96, they'll have 94 or 92 representatives. Uh, they'll have more than the French. <gasps> more than the British. Well, if they stay or not, who knows. But uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's what it really comes down to. It's the fact that if they come in, my goodness, the, Europe will change dramatically. It, it, it probably will. But is that something to be afraid of? I say no. I say you can never have enough friends. You can never have enough friends. That's my approach. There is an opinion that they are doing this only to open the borders and to like, spread, yeah, to, I don't know, to let them out and uh, give the opportunities to work and stuff because the lower class is, yeah. Gert Wilders, he is the man for you. <laughs> no, of course, you, all of these arguments are, they're valid concerns, right? If you, if you let Turkey in, they're going to flood our marketplace, they're going to take our jobs away, they're going to be speaking, they're going to be uh, mosques popping up all over the place, uh, Europeans will be in a minority, uh, and life as we know it will end. Um, that's an argument. It's, it's actually, a, I'm trying to belittle it, but actually it's a sound argument. It's something that, that should be analyzed and should be brought into the equation. But the problem that I see it is that that's the only argument sort of on the table. They're different, let's get rid of them, or you know, keep them out. But no one is analyzing what happens if we keep them out. Maybe life for us is actually worse if we try to keep them out than if we bring them in on a controlled basis. I mean, Europe has restricted movement of people. 
How many years has it been since the Latvians have been allowed to work uh, in uh, Germany? One. Yeah, one year. When did we join the EU? 2004. 2004. That's a long time to be locked out of a labor market, isn't it? So Europe certainly has experience of locking out other Europeans from labor markets. Uh, so we already have plenty of precedent that you can make exceptions for anything. I mean, we make up our own rules. Why don't we just make up an exception? If, I mean, if that's the concern. But it's a one-sided argument. They're different, and the people who have cornered this argument are the anti-immigrants. Across Europe, the parties are, are springing up. But I say that's a fine concern, but weigh the other side. What actually happens if you do keep them out, you will be forcing the Islamists up the political ladder because they're going to get clout, because the pro-Europeans are getting nowhere. So if I've been voting for pro-Europeans as a Turk, and they're out of the picture, well, okay, if they don't want me, to hell with them. I'll show them. And there's 80 million of them. If there were 2 million of them, it probably wouldn't be such a big concern. There's 80 million of them. They're in NATO. The U.S. took them into NATO. That was a pretty clever geopolitical move. Do you think the U.S. needed Turkey's ground and air forces as indispensable for the U.S.'s security? I'm a little doubtful of this. I think that in the State Department, there was a clever little analysis that said, okay, let's look at a map. How many friends do we have in this neighborhood? Well, I know, I know, Israel. Okay, anyone else? Um, uh, the Saudis? Yeah, okay, they're still our friends. We give them planes, they give us oil, it's a pretty good deal. Anyone else? Uh, not really. Well, what about Turkey? So, geopolitics is a very important part of politics. I'm seeing it more and more as one of the central parts of politics that people for a long time have been uh, unwilling to acknowledge. Pretending it doesn't exist. It exists in a big way. It influences the way we think. It fosters our fears. And people, clever politicians, will prey on your fears to get your support. Because it's an easy argument to say the infidel is coming. It's a tough argument to say, you know, there are lots of problems, but I think we should do this. That's convoluted. It takes... It's a second-level second argument, right? You have to kind of go through one level to get to the second. But the primitive one is keep them out, fight them down, lock them out, put them in jail. Those are easy things to say. That's how fundamentalists the world overwork, by the way. What makes them scary because they're effective. They hit nerves, raw nerves, fear. So I want to instill a different fear into you, the fear of keeping them out. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, well, I have to say thank you very much. You're a great group, and I wish you all the best in your exams, finishing your studies, and you hit that marketplace, stay in this 20%. You'll see life will be quite interesting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to Christianis. Uh, I can hear we have the very same simple, meant in a positive sense, view of the question of Turkish accession. Uh, for the very same reason, uh, there is no doubt it is the right solution, and there is no doubt that even though we are now two in the room, it doesn't change uh, the real situation that the majority of fear, or the wrong kind of fear, is against it. I'd like to highlight from what, what we were told today also this really fundamental problem of they and us, that there is still in, in, in Europe this feeling of them in Brussels as opposed to us, wherever us is. But which you find even in a minute country like Denmark. We have the peninsula of Jutland, which is our version of Latgala, and people in our Latgala have the same feeling about Copenhagen. There's us and there's them in Copenhagen. And let's milk them in Copenhagen. Uh, so the politicians from our Jutland or Latgala have been milking Parliament for, for, for years. And we have the finest network of motorways in Jutland and nobody to drive on them, simply because that, that was one of the concessions they, they could get the, the money for it. And finally, the other element I want to... So, I mean, that, that's the challenge. That's overcoming this feeling 
that Brussels is not them. Brussels is a part of us. And of course, in, uh, I should also say Strasbourg and Luxembourg to include the <laughs> European Parliament. Yes. Uh, but uh, the other thing I want to highlight was this issue about, about the Euro, that somewhere, again, I, we, I share very much the feelings that, that Christianus was mentioning, that if you look at it from a logical point of view, it's again an, a no-brainer. And during the Danish unsuccessful referendum to get the, the euro accepted in, in Denmark, they had on television an interview with the then director of the Danish National Bank. And they asked her the question, but isn't it important for a state to have that independent political power to decide on its monetary policy? And she said, yes, I, I agree absolutely. It's extremely important. And for Denmark, that independence and that power has an average duration of about 30 seconds because that's the time between a change of interest rate in Deutsche Bank and the equivalent change taking place in Denmark. Which was, of course, deep irony. And it flew like a brick. It convinced nobody, even though I thought it was the most brilliant argument of showing the whole discussion about the euro is nonsensical. Of course it's the right way forward. There is, there is no fear, there is no alternative. There is only a very clear, logical, positive effect of, of, of the euro. But there you face the real reality of politics. The referendum in Denmark went negative. The government was not active. They were in the 80% and not in the 20%. They were leaning back, saying, well, it's a one case. There's nothing that we have to convince anybody about. Which, again, underlines the message from Christian is what, what you need to do is to move into the 20%. And that's what we hope here, that we are able to instill in you the platform for having the tools of forming part of the 20%. So thank you very much, Christian, and thank you to all of you for participating. Okay.